Well, the fundamental issues about independence haven't changed since the referendum itself was held. Uh, a number of other things have changed, but they're political. Uh, the challenge that the supporters of independence faced was primarily economic, and that hasn't changed at all. If anything, uh, it's moved against them. What has changed, however, first of all, is their recognition uh, that they have to make an economic case, and that may explain uh, some of the, the extent to which they are a little more hesitant about pursuing independence now. But secondly, the extent to which the referendum itself has embedded the SNP in a leading position in Scottish politics, and that's a big difference. Well, having 56 seats in Westminster, or 55 if you uh, count the lady who has lost the, the whip meantime, uh, has certainly changed Scottish representation in Westminster, uh, and the level of support which it implies has changed the SNP. What we don't yet know is the extent to which that level of representation uh, will change Scotland's relationship with the rest of the UK. It was speculated uh, that the bloc of SNP MPs uh, whether it was 56 or a smaller number, uh, would hold the balance of power in Westminster, but they don't. And they have a real difficulty now in finding a role for themselves. Well, I don't particularly like the term Ulsterisation to describe Scotland's politics today, because Ulster is such a different place with such a different history. But nevertheless, uh, it's perfectly plain that the cleavage in Scottish politics now it is going to be the question of independence. Uh, the effect of the referendum uh, was not to settle the independence question, but to embed it in Scottish politics. Uh, and the effect, as we saw uh, in the Scottish election, is to give the parties the incentives to play to their own support. So the SNP crystallise the 45% yes vote in the referendum into essentially 45% support for the SNP. And what we saw in the Holyrood elections was a brave but perhaps misguided attempt by the Labour Party to move back onto what you might call old left-right politics, the politics of tax and spend. But the Conservative Party took the view that their task was to consolidate the unionist vote. And they did that very successfully in a number of constituencies and in so doing denied the SNP an overall majority. In the short run, I think it's unlikely that the SNP itself is going to break up in any sense. Uh, there is some competition on the pro-independence side uh, from the Green Party, uh, who became pro-independence and the extent to which their pro-independence is, is a matter of judgment. Uh, but their vote uh, in, in the list uh, is, is one of the best they've ever had. They've got six members now. And of course, those six members, uh, uh, if they had been SNP, or if for the sake of argument, uh, three of them had been, uh, would have given the SNP a majority. So to that extent, that kind of division in the Yes movement is bad for the SNP in partisan terms. Uh, we do see on the far left of the Yes movement uh, some peeling off uh, of those who uh, were attracted to independence because they saw it uh, as a way of a radical move towards social justice and they are beginning to be disappointed by the cautious stance of the SNP. That, I guess, was inevitable. Well, to a substantial degree, the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives already have a very decentralised party structure. The Liberal Democrats explicitly describe themselves as a federal party, uh, and the Conservative Party has always been very decentralised. It's anything but um, a centrally controlled party at the grassroots level. So in that sense, Labour are perhaps just catching up. Uh, and obviously, the structure of political parties has to reflect the constitutional structure in which they operate. Uh, what I don't think Labour uh, should imagine is that simply declaring themselves somehow to be an independent Labour Party, though that label has uh, other residences, uh, they will get back those votes which they lost to the SNP. It wasn't about the party independence uh, that, that, that lost them, 
That's such a big share of the vote last time. The SNP certainly failed to meet up to their own expectations as they had rather hoped to retain majority government and had I been asked before how to predict, I thought they would have done. Uh, what explains it is essentially tactical voting. Now, the SNP have captured, roughly speaking, 45% of the popular vote, uh, slightly more in the first-past-the-post seats and slightly less uh, in the list. Uh, but the Conservative Party in particular uh, persuaded pro-union voters, who after all are the majority of voters as a whole, uh, to support them in a number of constituencies uh, and did much better than they expected to do. And that is essentially what has denied uh, the SNP their majority. Uh, so they're in the position of minority government, where they were from 2007, uh, and uh, it's early days yet. The Parliament has just started uh, and we'll go into a summer recess, but it will be quite a challenge for Nicola Sturgeon's SNP to move back from the dominant position uh, to one in which they have to make deals uh, in order to get their budget through, to get their legislation through. So this is quite a significant change. I don't expect to see a second referendum any time soon. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, from a purely SNP perspective, they've said, understandably from their point of view, that they don't want to run another one until they're sure of winning it. Uh, and uh, what else would they say? But of course, it is not wholly in their gift. Uh, they have to uh, secure the legal authority to do so. Now, it's true, of course, that if for a prolonged period the majority of Scots did actually want to become independent, then Scotland would uh, in time become independent. But what is not at all clear uh, that it's appropriate for the SNP to seek to crystallise a temporary blip in support into a permanent change uh, in the constitution. Uh, they, uh, at the moment, uh, are backing off from their original position that a Brexit vote in the UK would be a trigger for a second referendum. Uh, they have identified no other triggers. Someone, I think, uh, on the SNP side suggested the re-election of a Conservative government in the UK would be a material change. Well, it might be material, but it certainly wouldn't be a change. Well, the Scotland Act is an unusual instrument in giving the devolved Parliament arguably more power than any federal unit in the most decentralised of federal states. It's certainly comparable to the bundle of powers uh, which are enjoyed by a canton in Switzerland or a province in Canada in terms of the proportion of spending and proportion of taxation uh, under devolved control. Whether this constitutes independence in the UK, uh, to use the phrase that some have used, I think is uh, hard to say, but it certainly arguably constitutes uh, home rule. And it looks in some ways very like the home rule that was discussed for Ireland uh, way back at the turn of the century before last. During the referendum campaign, one of the promises that was made uh, to the Scottish people by the pro-union parties was that they would have a much more powerful parliament with much bigger taxing powers and that they would retain the Barnett formula. Uh, squaring that circle proved technically very difficult because the Barnett formula is not something you would see in any federal financial system. Uh, an arrangement was, however, come to uh, by which uh, the Barnett formula is still used to calculate the grant, uh, and that grant is adjusted to take account of the stream of tax revenue from devolved taxes. The deal that was done was certainly advantageous to Scotland, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and from a purely Scottish point of view, it looks like a very good deal. Whether English taxpayers would take the same view is a different question. Lots of people have proposed slightly different answers to the West Lothian question, and for many years the answer was not to ask it. But given the degree of power that's now been decentralised 
uh, to Holyrood uh, some recognition uh, of the fact that England uh, has a separate constitutional and political identity is, I think, inevitable. Therefore, I've always been uh, a supporter of some form of English votes for English laws. Uh, the government's proposals are being piloted at the moment. Uh, my own view is that they have got some of it wrong, particularly in relation to taxation, uh, because they propose not merely English votes for English laws, but English votes for English taxes. And the difficulty with that, of course, is that English taxes are also UK taxes. Uh, and that problem uh, will come to a head, perhaps, uh, if there are differential majorities in the House of Commons for England and the UK, uh, something which is not the case at the moment. Uh, the Scotland Office, of course, is the successor to the Scottish Office, which uh, was the administrative devolution which Scotland enjoyed uh, for more than a century. But it is very much a rump, and its job is now to manage the relationship between the UK government and the devolved government of Scotland. Uh, the 2016 legislation, in a sense, increases its role uh, because there are more specifically Scottish issues to be dealt with, uh, not least the question of the exercise of um, Scottish powers of taxation, but also because one aspect of the Scotland Act which hasn't had much discussion is the new welfare powers, which means that welfare, social security, is in some senses a shared responsibility between the devolved government and the UK government. Most other devolved powers are very clearly separated and delineated uh, and quite uh, distinct uh, from the reserve powers exercised by UK ministers. Uh, but the welfare powers are deeply connected to the UK welfare system. And that certainly gives the Secretary of State for Scotland, or indeed whatever UK minister is responsible uh, for relations with the devolved administrations, a more complex and demanding role. It certainly looks considerably more centralised in Scotland than it did 10 years ago. Uh, Scottish local government has been largely disempowered, starting perhaps with the first of all administrations, but certainly uh, since the two SNP administrations, uh, power has been centralised in Edinburgh uh, rather than at local level. Uh, no Scottish local authority has made a tax decision for eight years. Uh, Scottish local authorities have been stripped of responsibility uh, for police and fire services, which are now exercised at a national level. Uh, in that sense, uh, Scotland is more centralised than England as well, because the decentralisation in England has been a feature of the UK government's policy, notably uh, city deals and northern powerhouses and so on. To the extent that those are uh, operational and not merely uh, decorative, uh, Scotland is, in a sense, falling rather behind the rest of the UK. It's certainly become a very centralised country. The possibility of a British exit from the EU is certainly a wild card uh, in the Scottish independence debate. It, it's certainly true uh, that the Scottish National Party adopted the policy of independence in Europe uh, after a long period of being anti-European because they perceived that it offered a degree of safeguard uh, for Scotland, uh, particularly if the rest of the UK remained in the EU. There are those in the SNP who thought, and may still think, that the UK leaving uh, the EU would provide the trigger for Scottish independence, though that now seems much less likely uh, from what uh, senior SNP ministers are saying. It would, however, put Scotland in a very difficult position uh, if the choice was to be offered after an EU departure by the UK. First of all, it's not at all clear what the choice would be, because that depends on the nature of the UK's continuing relationship, if any, uh, with Europe. So if the UK were to become like Norway, uh, that's one scenario. But if it becomes like Australia, then that's quite another. 
and in particular if there were to have to be a hard border between the EU and non-EU in the UK, Hadrian's Wall being recreated, if you like, that would put Scotland in a very difficult position and it's a choice which Scotland would find it very hard to make. Uh, would you cut off your nose to spite your face, as it were, uh, by withdrawing from your very dominant trading partner, the UK, 70% of the Scottish economy is closely linked with the uh, rest of the UK economy, uh, or would you give up your European status, which a majority of people in Scotland seem to want to keep. Uh, so uh, this is certainly one of the most uncertain areas uh, that would happen uh, if the UK voted uh, to leave the EU.